Here is a sculpture done from a bunch of drawings like the ones you just saw. Your typical little gray man, or typical zeta reticulin, whatever you want to call him. Two arms, two legs, a head and a body, skull, skull bigger in proportion to the body than ours. Big eyes, practically no nose, mouth, ears. Uh, typical alien. In the days of Alex Jones in the Denver airport, conspiracy theories surrounding flying saucers almost seemed quaint. With disillusionment towards governing bodies and paranoia seemingly at an all-time high, modern conspiracies and their peddlers have been given unmerited legitimacy. Now I'm no believer, but I don't think it's entirely fair to group in the possibility of extraterrestrial life with something like the claim the ruling elite is a race of lizard people. On this episode of Media Loss, we will listen to one of the leading proponents of UFOs, Stanton T. Friedman, as he makes the case that flying saucers are real. Filmed at Kennedy Space Center, this is the second part of his video lecture series, examining the existence of life forms from other planets. Friedman, who is a nuclear physicist, has dedicated nearly 50 years of research into UFO phenomena. This video, which was produced in 1996, consists mainly of Friedman arguing government claims that popular cases of alien contact were misunderstandings or imaginings. He focuses on three cases in particular, the abduction of couple Barney and Betty Hill in 1961, the incident at Roswell, New Mexico, and the supposed leaking of the Majestic 12 documents. Again, I'm no believer, but what separates Friedman from someone like Alex Jones is that he's able to present convincing evidence. He's skeptical. He doesn't just swallow any claim that comes his way simply because it fits his narrative. I can't say whether the information featured in this video is true, that the Hills were actually abducted by aliens, or if the Majestic 12 documents are real. What I can say is that given the size of the universe, it's more likely than not we aren't alone. Whether you believe or not, I hope you at least find this video entertaining. If you do enjoy this video, please subscribe. As always, thanks for watching. This is Betty and Barney Hill. It's a very famous case. It took place in 1961. There's a whole book, The Interrupted Journey, television movie, The UFO Incident, starring uh, James Earl Jones. It was September 19th, 1961. Betty and Barney were driving home to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is on the coast between Portland, Maine, and Boston, from Montreal. Driving through the White Mountains late at night, nobody around. Betty spots a strange object. Barney was driving. She's looking out her side. A light in the sky, moving, following the contour of the mountains. And she watched it for a while. She wasn't going to say anything. Suddenly, we began to see a strange light in the sky, which was maneuvering in a very erratic pattern. This light began flying along beside us and did this for about 30 miles until we came to an area known as Indian Head. Took the binoculars, they're bird watchers, took the binoculars out of the glove compartment, looked over at it, and it was strange. And it was moving in a strange fashion. Finally, she worked up enough courage to tell Barney. It's late at night now, after midnight. Barney, uh, there's a flying saucer out there. Oh, Betty, there are no flying saucers. This must be an airplane. He looks probably a Piper Cub. Don't worry about it. You know what a Piper Cub's doing up there at one in the morning, I don't know. but. She says, Barney, it can't be. Look at it. Look how it's moving. Look at the lights. Oh, well, maybe you're right, Betty. It must be a helicopter. A helicopter. There are no flying saucers. And they talk quietly as they're heading south in the valley. This is following the hills. And suddenly it moves out across the road. And at that place, this light left the top of the mountain, came out over the highway, and stopped in midair directly in front of us. Barney jams on the brakes, gets out of the car. He's bound and determined. He's going to prove to Betty there's nothing strange about that strange thing out there. In the first place, it's sitting still. It's just hovering. Less than 200 yards away, he estimates. 60 to 80 feet in diameter, just sitting there and no sound. Sitting there. No visible external engines, no wings, no tail, no blinking red and green lights. He cranks up the binoculars. There's a double row of windows there. He's moved out away from the vehicle now. Suddenly, he gets scared because on the other side of the windows, looking back at him, are some strange looking beings. He panicked and he ran back to the car saying they planned to capture us and we had to get out of there. And we went speeding down the highway. He burns rubber, he's getting out of there. 
And at that point, we heard beeping sounds and the car vibrated. They see a sign that says Concord, New Hampshire, 17 miles. Should have been 50 miles. There's a lot of other strange little details that you have to read the book, The Interrupted Journey by John Fuller, to get. Now, when we arrived home, we had many puzzles. The tops of Bonnie's shoes were scuffed. Our watches had stopped functioning. There were highly polished spots in the trunk of the car. Anyway, they report to the police that next day who say, call Pease Air Force Base, which is just outside Portsmouth. They report it there. They hear about NICAP, a group that investigates UFOs. So a month later, a NICAP investigator comes out and gets their whole story. But he has them go over the story systematically. What time did you leave Montreal? How fast were you driving? How much time for coffee and gas? And what time did you get home? When they do it this way, it becomes painfully obvious that they got home at least two hours later than they should have gotten home. It's only 192 miles. But the biggest mystery of all was the fact that it had taken us seven hours to drive 190 miles. It was suggested then that they see a hypnotist to find out what happened during the missing time interval. Well, they were both busy people. Betty, a social worker, super, supervising the welfare department, state of New Hampshire. Barney, uh, working in the post office down in Boston, but on the governor's civil rights commission. Betty checks with a colleague. As a social worker, she knew lots of psychologists. You know, we seem to have this missing time. Don't worry about it. Your memory will come back. Just wait a while. So they waited and waited and waited and waited. And Betty had nightmares about strange beings kidnapping them. Barney developed an ulcer that got so bad he couldn't go to work. By now, two years have gone by, and they've got to do something. They've got to get Barney back to work. Betty gets a referral, or Barney gets a referral, from a psychologist to a psychiatrist, Dr. Benjamin Simon, down in Boston. And the idea was to take care of two problems at once, find out what happened during the missing time, and get rid of the ulcer so he could get back to work. Okay, every Saturday morning they drive the 60 miles to Boston. Betty waits outside. Barney goes in. Dr. Simon hypnotizes him, has him relive, not retell, but relive with all the emotions a portion of the experience. He tapes it, induces amnesia at the end of the session, so Barney won't remember what he said, can't talk to Betty about it, calms him down. Some of these are pretty powerful sessions. Sends Barney out, brings Betty in, does the same thing with her. And he said, I know it, but the others object. And I said, but, but this is my proof. This goes on every week for three and a half months, neither one of them knowing what's going on in the sessions, except that there must be something good happening because Barney's ulcer is taken care of. He's able to get back to work. Finally, Dr. Simon figures they're ready. He brings them both in together instead of separately and plays back a composite tape of all these sessions. I've heard the tape. They're astonished to find that they had each independently relived the same incredible experience. The beings that had been on the craft were now standing in the middle of the road, a dirt road blocking our way. The car motor stalled. They separated, came up on each side, took us out of the car, and at that point, I realized that they undoubtedly planned to take us on board. Of that craft having landed, of them being taken on board against their will, treated as specimens. Stick a needle here, scrape a little skin there. I was taken into the first room, Barney into the second room, where we were given, uh, as the leader, as I call him, gave us testing. No religious messages, no trip anywhere. Our examinations were very much similar in that with both Barney and I, they checked our eyes, ears, nose, throat, took samples of our hair, fingernail, and they scraped our skin. They were put back out, told they wouldn't remember, and didn't until this elaborate, sophisticated, expensive procedure was conducted. Now, let's face it, that's a pretty far out story. Well, I read the book, The Interrupted Journey. I read the two Look Magazine articles. I talked to John Fuller, talked to Dr. Simon. It was in my gray basket, not black, not white, maybe. Everybody needs a gray basket about UFOs. And then I had the lucky opportunity in November 1968 to spend four hours with Betty and Barney, just the three of us, in Pittsburgh, where I was living. 
I was very impressed with them. Obviously sensible, sensitive, intelligent people. Make a long story short, I buy the story. And you say, big deal, you believe them, where's the evidence? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of evidence. I only want to focus on one part of it as appropriate for being here at the Space Center. Betty, under hypnosis, is reliving how she's trying to get the leader of this 11-being crew to tell her where he's from. And the understatement of the decade. I said, I know you're not from this planet. Now, Barney was in another room. They were being examined separately. So finally, to get her off his back, this leader shows her what I can only describe as a three-dimensional star map. It was like a, uh, an aquarium with points of light, which were supposedly stars, three feet by two feet by two feet, three different kinds of lines connecting these stars for trade expeditions and occasional expeditions and regular heavy trade, two big circles that were supposedly uh, the base stars connected by lots of lines. And she's looking up at this thing, and she asks the leader, well, where are you on the map? wise guy alien he says you know where you are on the map I told him no that I knew nothing about astronomy how can I tell you where you're from if uh, where I'm from if you don't know where you're at I just didn't have the necessary knowledge now poor dr. Simon the psychiatrist world-class expert on post-traumatic stress syndrome using hypnosis to unlock what happened I mean, it's bad enough he's got two intelligent people here telling this crazy story about a saucer landing beings taking him on board. But now he's got a star map and trade routes, oh boy. He gives, asks if Betty can remember what the map looked like. She says yes. He gives her a post-hypnotic suggestion. If and only if she can remember it accurately, please draw it later on. She goes home and she draws, and you can see it here. This is what was published in the book. And it's kind of fascinating trade routes and occasional expeditions, but there is one little teeny tiny problem. What does it mean? We have no reference point. It's obviously not all the stars in the galaxy. It's not all the stars in the neighborhood. We'll never know is what people thought. It, maybe it means something, maybe it doesn't, but there's no way to find out. Well, a brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish had read the book she was curious. She didn't think aliens would look anything like us, and they seemed to be sort of humanoid. But she visited Betty and decided, well, there was one thing she could do. She could build a three-dimensional model of our local galactic neighborhood and see if she could find a three-dimensional pattern that matched the two-dimensional one that Betty drew. Well, it turned out she's now built a total of 26 three-dimensional models. Uh, the point of doing this now is that the stars are where they are. They're not randomly distributed. Uh, if we build a model, we can look around it from all different directions. What's difficult about doing this is we have great angle data on the stars. We know where to aim a telescope to see a particular star. Two angles tell us. But we don't have good distance data. Astronomers aren't going anywhere. It doesn't much matter how far or how close along this line of sight. But you can't build a model without the distance data. Now, Marjorie thought she'd get many fits to the map. She got none until she built a new model using, using the newest data, the Gliese catalog, Wilhelm Gliese, catalog of nearby stars, had the best data ever compiled on the distances. She rebuilt the model, and lo and behold, there was the pattern, angle for angle, line length for line length, what Betty had drawn. It's a special day for Marjorie, believe me. Now, here's a, one of her models that matches the star map. Now, there's several special things here you have to understand. First is a local neighborhood. The, the biggest model only went out 50 light years or so, so right next door. Second, all the stars connected with the lines are the right kind for planets and life sun-like stars and all the sun-like stars in this very well-defined three-dimensional volume of space are in the pattern now the chance of that happening by accident remembering that only 46 out of the thousand stars in a local neighborhood are like the sun and yet every one of the pattern stars is a sun-like star and every sun-like star in this volume of space is part of the pattern the chance of that happening by accident one in 10,000 to one in a million, depending on whose statistics you believe. 
several special things now. One, the pattern makes sense, near a star, near a star, near a star, that's good, not back and forth. Two, uh, strangely enough, it turns out that all the pattern stars are in a plane. It's like pepperoni on a pizza pan, thin pizza, all in a plane rather than raisins in a big fat loaf of raisin bread, which is what you'd expect, that they'd be distributed all over the place. Nobody knew that before Marjorie's work. Most important, nobody doing what Marjorie did before Betty had the experience in 61 or the book came out in 65, could have come up with the same identification of the stars because the correct distance data wasn't available until 1969. Obvious question. Where did Betty a social worker knew nothing about astronomy, get the right information as to where the stars were in 1961, when nobody on this planet had that information at that time. The only possible explanation is that it came from somebody from off the Earth. We can see that the source of that information had to be somebody who'd been away from the solar system. None of us Earthlings have been, so far as we know. Even more intriguing, I suppose, is the fact that this work tells us where those particular aliens originated. Here's a map that shows the names of the stars in our very local neighborhood. Our star is the sun up in the top right-hand portion of the picture. Now, we're out in the boondocks here. Uh, the sun is four and a half light years from the next star over. There's not many stars behind us for 15 or 20 light years. We're out in the boondocks. The base stars, however, are 37 light years or so away from us. Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. That's the Greek letter Zeta and the constellation reticulum. You can't see it from here. You've got to go down the equator or below. These two stars, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticulum, are only a few light weeks apart. They're a hundred times closer to each other than our star, the sun, is to the next star over. A hundred times. So from a planet around one, looking over at the other, you can see the other star all day long, and with a not very big telescope, you could directly observe, observe planets around the other star. Now, it wouldn't be surprising if there were earlier interstellar between the stars traveling. When your nearest neighbor is only a few light weeks away as it is for them, as opposed to our situation several light years. Especially when I tell you one of the key features about this star, these two stars, is that they're about a billion years older than the sun. Billion with the B. Just, just quickly, yes or no, do you believe in extraterrestrial life conceptually? The, well, in the probability or at least possibility? There are 24 <laughs> of us that left the Earth and came back. You know, you know what there are 12 I mean, of us that walked on the moon. Uh, but how about things with, you know, like green and... Somebody you know, originated you know. someplace else. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Just... Uh, why not? Well, okay, why not? That's a good enough answer. All right. But we don't know. No, I don't know. So again, would it be surprising to any rational person that beings with another sun-like star just around the corner would get started sooner on interstellar travel when they've got a billion year opportunity for a head start. Very exciting piece of work. I received a copy of the radar report from Peace Air Force Base, where they had tracked an unidentified craft at 2.14 a.m. in the about the time, just about the time we estimate that the UFO left. We went back and we found the spot where we were captured. It was not a fantasy. It was a real experience. And I believe that I have enough evidence to establish that.
On January the 13th, a Friday appropriately, on an English talk show, Nick and Ann, a British rock musician named Reg Presley, no relation to Elvis, startled the world by saying that he was aware of 15 reels of 10 minutes each of 16 millimeter footage shot of autopsies and wreckage relating to crash flying saucers in New Mexico. Incredible news. He hadn't seen much of it, and it belonged to a man named Ray Santilli. Last year that some tantalizing pictures were released. Black and white grainy footage showing an alien autopsy. The debate about whether they're genuine or not is still raging. The footage was first seen in this country last August in a Channel 4 documentary called The Roswell Incident. It told the story of a UFO that crash-landed in New Mexico in 1947. This was one of the most important events in UFO history. The program used several minutes of footage which apparently showed an autopsy carried out on aliens recovered from the crash site. The footage was brought to light by a video producer called Ray Santilli. We're talking about roughly 16 minutes of footage of an autopsy of a supposed alien recovered from a crash flying saucer in 1947. Surely one of the most important discoveries ever made by mankind. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary investigation. But the organizers of a UFO conference in Leeds next week say they have new evidence which will prove the footage to be a hoax. They're flying in the top Roswell investigator, Stanton T. Friedman. He believes aliens did land at Roswell, but he doesn't believe the autopsy film. I was here in April of 95. I met with Mr. Santilli. I did not get a chance to see the footage. He wouldn't show it to me. He didn't want me to see the footage. He didn't want anybody who was going to be critical. He was looking for people who would go along for the ride, I think, who would say, yay, verily, this is the greatest thing since peanut butter. Now, on about July 2nd, there was apparently a mid-air collision between two flying saucers in New Mexico. One of them came down almost intact in the plains of San Agustin, a very remote area west of Socorro, New Mexico. The other part, apparently part of it exploded, showering debris on the Foster Ranch, southeast of Corona, New Mexico, northwest of Roswell. Uh, and a couple miles away, apparently bodies were found. There was some lightweight, very strong, seemingly structural material that you couldn't break through with a sledgehammer. Very thin. And there were some I-beam-like pieces, uh, perhaps three-eighths inch high. Had the weight of balsa wood, nothing to these things. But you couldn't cut them, break them, burn them, and there were strange pastel symbols along the inside of the eye. But as the first to talk to many of the key witnesses, without television cameras, without any public sort of side to this thing, I'm absolutely convinced that bodies were recovered at both locations. We have descriptions of those bodies from people who saw them. We have descriptions of wreckage. And that's a very important database. It's also important to realize that there was very strong intimidation of many of the people who were involved in this case. One of the people who was never said anything about this, wasn't spoken to until I spoke to him in 1989, was Glenn Dennis. He was a mortician at the local funeral home, the Ballard Funeral Home. And uh, when he finally told his story, he had talked to a nurse at the base who had been involved in what was apparently a, an autopsy, cutting up little bodies that smelled to high heaven. She said, you won't believe what happened. And she said, before I talk to you, before I tell you anything, <coughs> excuse me, I'm having a throat problem here, but she said, uh, you have to give me a sacred oath that you will not ever mention my name or not. And she said, you can get me in a lot of trouble. So she said, but I'm going to tell you, you don't know where you got this, you know. And she said she never smelled anything so horrible in her life when she got in there. And uh, I said it was, it was the most gruesome, most horrible sight that she'd ever seen in her life. The smell was, it was almost devastating. She said, I was never so horrified in my life. She said, no, this isn't what it is. She said, this is something that that no one's ever seen. So there is no question from Glenn Dennis's testimony, the testimony of all these other people, uh, people who saw the bodies out in the plains, that at least two saucers crashed, that 
wreckage was recovered, that the government grabbed all the goodies, intimidated the people, had bodies. And if there were bodies, there would have been autopsies. And if there were autopsies, there certainly would have been footage, film footage shot. Friedman was the original investigator at Roswell and has been researching the incident for over 20 years. He thought the autopsy film could be important, but when he finally saw it, he was unimpressed. The main reasons I was disappointed when I saw the footage. One, the body didn't look like any alien I'd ever heard described. They have two separate testimonies as to what the bodies from the Roswell crashes look like. The question is, is the footage genuine? Or there are two other possibilities. People want to say it's either a fraud or it's real. It could be footage shot of a real autopsy of a genetically handicapped or several earthlings, as opposed to just a Hollywood production. We have all three possibilities, and we don't know. So I have made a very massive effort, as have a number of other people, to try to sort this out. One problem is that every time I checked on Mr. Santilli, he wasn't telling the whole truth. As time has gone on, we've looked more carefully at the footage itself. For example, there's one scene where the right hand seemingly is completely separated from the arm. There's a little wedge of space there. This is with six digits now. It, and then later, it seems to be attached. It's as if some, somebody took a hand and put it on an arm but one of the witnesses that talked to Glenn Dennis, a nurse at the base hospital, told him. She said, last night I made a diagram. She said, you won't believe this, but she said, I made a diagram. And she said, <clears throat> these little bodies. And she gave me a, uh, she drew me a diagram of, a, of an arm. Because she said the anatomy from, from the shoulder to here was real short, and this arm was longer here. Which is the reverse of our situation. She said four digits. That doesn't match. Practically no ears, nose, mouth. Just a little slit, some holes. And yet there are very clear ear folds, whatever you want to call them, and something of a mouth and certainly a nose. The eyes were very deeply uh, set back and set in. And she said uh, the amazing thing about the skulls that, that uh, it wasn't like ours, that it was kind of like a newborn baby. They were kind of flexible that, you know, the doctors could move, that it wasn't, you know, like a hard skull. None of this stuff matches. Now, I cannot say that we have proven that this is a hoax shot by this company at this location on this day. And Mr. Santilli told me, not only that they had a boxes of material about the cameraman, which proved that he was who he says he was and where he says he was at the time, None of that's been put forth. But he also said that Kodak had dated the film. Well, as it turns out, they hadn't. He'd given them a piece of leader with no image on it. Well, Kodak's requirements were about uh, 50 frames, two seconds worth, roughly, of film full width, because shrinkage is important from determining dates, and with image that's in the autopsy footage. He promised to provide it, promised to provide it, promised to provide it. The wreckage in the film. Now, if you look carefully, the so-called I-beams, that they call them that, have strange symbols, which spell video, if you look at it in the right angle, which sort of old Greek letters. It doesn't look anything at all like the replica that's been created by Dr. Jesse Marcel, working with an engineer. He handled pieces of the wreckage. Uh, and he's talking about I-beams like this size rather than this size. We've just got lots of questions and no answers. And some of those questions should have answers if we are to proceed on the basis that this stuff is legitimate. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary investigation. This footage has not had it. In December 1984, I was first informed that a colleague, two colleagues of mine in California, Jamie Chandray and William Moore, had received in the mail a roll of film in which there were two sets of eight negatives each of a highly classified document which said that there was a crashed flying saucer recovered near Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947. 
was a briefing for President-elect Eisenhower dated 18 November 1952. Eight pages is all we had. There's a list of a whole bunch of attachments which weren't there. And the eighth page was a supposed memorandum from President Truman dated September 1947, establishing a group called Operation Majestic 12. And the briefing for Eisenhower clearly states it's an intelligence and research and development uh, highly classified activity. It names the members of the Majestic 12 group, which included the first three directors of Central Intelligence, several outstanding scientists. Uh, it was an all-star cast. The question, of course, is were these documents genuine? I spent well over a decade on these documents. Now, all the original members of MJ-12 were dead, the last one dying just three months before we got the documents, which is very significant no matter how you look at it. Document classification is confidential, secret, top secret, and then top secret something, ultra, umbra, magic, whatever. That's a compartmental designation. You can only have access to that information if you've been cleared for that compartment. I've been to 15 archives at one time or another, spending weeks at some of them, the Eisner Library, Truman Library, National Archives, Library of Congress Manuscript Division, etc. I have never yet seen special compartmented information. It's extraordinarily rare. Another document received much more recently is a standard operating manual. What do you do if you recover the wreckage and bodies from crashed flying saucers? Also top secret magic. That's almost too good to be true. It's on a roll of film, more than 25 pages. Wow. Several of us, all of whom have worked on highly classified programs, all of whom have technical backgrounds, four of us all together, have been digging into these very deeply. It is our consensus that we can't find any reason for rejecting these documents. We've all raised questions, but the documents pass the test. So I don't think there's any question that there really was a Majestic 12 group. What's interesting about the operating manual is it makes it sound routine, the recovery of wreckage. Remember, the government has the radar. They can spot something coming in. And it gives standard procedures for lying to the public and for how you box up this stuff, wrap it and ship it, and where different kinds of things go to, including bodies. And it stresses that national security here is what's the all-powerful element in determining what we do. If we've got to lie to the public, if we have to give cover stories, an important part of this is to keep the Russians from knowing what we're doing. So these documents are probably the most important ones ever leaked to the American public. I worked under security for 14 years. I can appreciate the need for security about certain things sometimes. But I think it's time that the American people and the rest of the world got told that planet Earth is being visited by extraterrestrial spaceships, that we've known about it since 1947. We have bodies, we have wreckage, we've learned a lot of technology. I think the public can handle it. Don't you?